Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. My name is Bob Bianchi. Happy Monday to you. It's great to be back with you. We got a lot on the plate. I'll be with you from 12 to 3. The Law and Crime Network, gavel to gavel coverage on some of the most fascinating trials across the United States, as well as legal cases that are developing day in and day out. Wow, what an emotional verdict. And you know, this network covers these trials and how our guys find them, I don't know. But they're razor thin kind of cases and really interesting and give us a lot of opportunity for real trials lawyers, real seasoned people who have really been in that courtroom to break it down like no other network in the world, to be honest with you, not to mention the United States in particular. And one of those very people is my friend Gene Rossi, uh, 30 years with the DOJ, sort of over 100 trials. I'm getting tired telling all these credentials. It makes me feel yeah. bad. I got Gene Rossi, war room down there at the DOJ, and um, is a regular guest on my show and a law and crime uh, legal analyst. So, Gene, welcome to the show. I uh, hope you're having a great Monday. Good afternoon. April Fool's Day. Yes, yes. And so let's say, speaking of April Fool's Day, you know, Gene, last week, I know we broke this case down a lot when it was going on, and we found that there was a, a, a kind of like a lot of maybe holes in the case, specifically in terms of the prosecution's uh, position with this, as well as some discovery, quote unquote, violations. Now, I'm putting discovery violations in quotes uh, because it was a big issue that happened during the course of the trial where over 100 pages of information that the defense argued was Brady material, that was material that is favorable to the defense, was produced. But I had an opportunity to speak to Ed Bull. He's the prosecutor out there, Gene, and um, he, he made a very uh, a, you know, bold move. He's the the head guy, and you know I love that, the head yeah. guy actually t rolled up his sleeves, went in there and tried this very difficult case, and they knew it was difficult, but his argument, Gene, was that I believe in my heart. When I asked him, will you look for the other murderer, potentially, if this guy's found not guilty, he says, well, always keep those investigative ends open, but I believe in my heart we had the right guy. Sounds to me like when you feel that way, there's not a lot of law enforcement assets that are going to be looking for anyone else. That's correct. If you feel that when you presented that case to the grand jury, and I assume they did that, that you have in your heart a belief that you have a prima facie case and a reasonable probability of conviction. I can say in my almost 30 years, uh, Bob, that I think there was maybe one case where we got the wrong guy, but what happened was we arrested somebody who had the same name as my defendant, and then when we brought him in, we realized we had the wrong guy. So I never went to trial against the wrong guy. Uh, I, I probably could not sleep with myself for the rest of my life if I ever did that. Yeah, you know, he seems like a really squared away guy after having interviewed him. But nevertheless, sometimes we get pigeonholed into what we call confirmation bias. In 12 jurors, he said he's going to actually listen to what they have to <clears> say. I guess they're allowed to speak to them out there um, and find out whether, whether it was that they just didn't meet the burden to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt or whether they genuinely believed he was innocent. That is a huge distinction in the law. But let's go to something that was very compelling and used by the prosecution in the case as a very powerful tool for them, although ultimately it didn't get them over that goal line, and that is the 911 call that the defendant, Jason Carter, made after discovering his mom's dead body or, as the prosecution alleges, after he murdered her. One word is your emergency. Yeah, I, I need to, I, I need to hear your prayer. Okay, well, to what address? Oh, on 32 Perry Street. <laughs> it's Bill Carter, and I'm his son. My mom, I'm a right here on the floor. What? 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 Okay, is she inside the house or outside? You're laying here on the kitchen floor. Okay, and this is... Hey, Bill, I'm sending an ambulance to you. Let me double check the address. So 132 Perry Street in Pleasantville, correct? It's Lacona, Iowa. It's in Lacona? 132 Perry Street, Lacona. Okay. Okay, so what you like you the two hours what happened? There's a hole through the floor, it was in the refrigerator. I don't know what she was trying to I don't get what happened. 
You said there's a hole through the floor in the refrigerator? Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, I'm going to go ahead and send the officers and deputies and the ambulance to the house there so we can help you, okay? Okay. They're already on the way, okay? We'll be just a just a moment here, okay? okay. All right, Bill, I'm gonna go ahead and let you go. Bye. 911 calls are very powerful evidence. They were in many murder cases that I've tried, but they can cut both ways. The question really is, is he acting hysterically like that just because he's acting or is he genuinely emotionally upset? And of course, if he's genuinely emotionally upset, that could mean he did it or he didn't do it. But here he's saying he doesn't know what happened over and over again. So you, you take that for what it's worth to the jury is one piece of evidence. But another significant piece of evidence in the case came from a Curtis Seddon. He is a friend and a former first responder who is describing when he first got to the scene, said and actually went to the scene, what Jason was like. So now you have not only the 911 call with the defendant himself, but you have somebody else who knows him well explaining what his emotional temperament was like. Let's take a look. I arrived on scene, who was present? I arrived on scene and uh, drove up the driveway. Uh, Bill and, and Jason Carter were present outside the residence. So were you the first emergency responder to arrive on scene? Yes, I was. What did you observe when you first arrived? First got to the residence, um, driving up the residence, I had some trouble finding the actual sign uh, for there because it was partially, partially obscured by tree. Uh, once I found I drove up into the driveway. Um, I had planned on, usually I would pull my vehicle farther forward in the driveway uh, to make room for the ambulance and other responding personnel. However, uh, I was being interacted with uh, uh, rather quickly by uh, Jason and Bill at that point in time. Can you describe for the jury Bill Carter's demeanor when you first encountered him? Um, Bill Carter was uh, visibly upset. Um, he made some statements um, that something's happened to Shirley. Um, I then walked up towards the residence, but he was visibly upset at that point in time. What about Jason's demeanor? I would describe his demeanor as uh, acting hysterically. Um, he was upset, but as acting more in a hysterical manner, uh, saying a lot of things. So, Gene Rossi, what we have there is a 911 call and then followed up with a friend. And what I like about the idea of the friend is that if you believe the friend, the friend knows, you know, we all know each other. It's a very nuanced thing, but it's, it's so obvious. They know how you respond to stimuli. They know your general demeanor, your temperament. And so somebody who knows you has a better idea of whether or not you're genuinely upset about something or whether you're fabricating. Do you agree with that? Oh, boy. I've been married for 34 years and... <laughs> I can, I can tell when my wife is in a great mood, a bad mood, a medium mood, and nobody else can tell. Absolutely. So this t testimony, I mean, do you, do you feel so far with the 911 call? I mean, we know ultimately what happened. We also know that the jury came back with a not guilty on it. Uh, but in this particular case, given the fact there was no real forensic, solid forensic evidence, other than relying on a uh, safe and a, and a gun case in which the defendant's prints appeared with other people. These witnesses don't seem to be great for the prosecution. No, and the 911 call, I remember listening to this about a week ago. I thought he had uh, a little bit of an acting aspect to it. And then you contrast it with uh, Curtis Selden, who went to the, uh, was first responder. There was sort of a dichotomy between the 911 
and his demeanor to his to his first responder and friend. And you know what, Bob? We don't know what the jury was hung up on. We don't know why they got to not guilty. I do know they won the wrongful death suit. So one jury agreed with the father, who was the plaintiff. So we don't know what caused the not guilty. And Gene, the wrongful death suit uh, that you're talking about, was that was filed by uh, the, the husband or the father um, and, and it, with a preponderance of the evidence in the civil case, but without a lot of information that later came out in the criminal case. And I talked to prosecutor Ed Bull about that, whether, you know, kind of it's odd that a civil suit precedes a criminal case. He indicated, and I'm glad to hear this, that he tried to convince the family not to file the civil suit because the state witnesses would be cross-examined and subject to then cross-examination in the criminal case, yet they were in the courtroom in the civil case watching everything that was going on and developing leads. What are your thoughts about that? You, you should never allow a civil case to go before a criminal for the reason you just said. And at the federal level, if you have a federal uh, criminal case and a parallel civil case, the judge will always stay the civil proceeding and let the criminal take its course because you get depositions, uh, you know, transcripts. It's very uh, unhelpful for a prosecution to have a civil case go first. You know, there's an opposite side to that coin, though, Gene, where some argued, the defense certainly argued here, that this was actually providing information through the defendant to the police that they otherwise would be unable to get because he has a right to remain silent, but because he had to defend himself in the civil suit, they got data that actually hurt him, you know, as far as his case. And you know what Ed Bull said? It broke both ways with respect to that civil suit going before the criminal case. We got to go to break, guys. Stay tuned. We're going to have more... Gene Rossi on the other end of the break. Okay, welcome back. We're going over the Jason Carter case. Gene Rossi, real quick, before we throw to another clip, my question is, found responsible in the civil case, the defendant is found not guilty for the murder in the criminal case, but won't the state just retry the murder charges and eventually get a guilty finding in this case? You mean in a, in a Jason Carter case? Yes. I, I thought it was a not guilty. Yes. Yeah, so won't they just go to court and retry the case again? No, it's an acquittal, double jeopardy. Are you sure? Yeah, if you try a murder case at the state level. April Fools, Gene. Oh, oh my God. April <laughs> Fools, my friend. Oh, God, you got me good. I, I, I knew I was going to see how you were going to try to get me out of that. And I told all our chatters to get ready because I was going to give an April Fool's question to Gene Rossi. You did great, Gene. Oh, you, you know what, Bob? I swear to God, I, I was going through my mind going, what am I missing? What am I missing? <laughs> well, I'll take that as a sign of respect that you think that I could say something that is so stupid, right? Hey, Gene, thanks. I'm only kidding. But listen, listen, I have a little fun with these cases, Gene. Um, but... Listen, it wasn't not guilty, and obviously, just for purposes of the record, um, the state can't retry a case when there's a not guilty on the basis of double jeopardy. One of the people that testified in the case was the dad of the defendant, the, the husband of the woman killed, Bill Carter, who gave very dramatic emotional testimony. Bill Carter was the one who filed a civil suit against his son, Jason Carter, got a verdict against the defendant which I suspect could potentially get reversed in that civil case based upon newly discovered evidence that was withheld from the attorneys all the way through the criminal trial, right to the end of the criminal trial came out, that may be a basis of reversal in that civil case. Nevertheless, he suffered a tragic loss, and his testimony was very compelling. Yeah, yeah, Gene, excellent commentary as always. Well, listen, we got a lot more going on. Scandarito, John Chuck, a lot more of the Carter case, a lot more of everything on the Law & Crime Network, but we got to do a little bit. Business. Gonna go to a break. Stick with us. We'll be right back.